The following program is brought to you by coronavirus and the newest in the beta coronavirus line, COVID-19. Coronavirus, bringing human misery for 8,000 years. And by the state of Wisconsin's prohibition on gatherings of more than 10 people. Wisconsin, forward. And by the faculty and staff of Lawrence University. Welcome to Historic Preservation Lecture 12 on Historic Preservation Professionals. Now I want to give you a little caveat at the beginning and that is that this lecture is going to be biased towards archaeology. I am an archaeologist and so the first part of the lecture is on archaeology and it's probably going to be the longest part. I am going to talk about um, architectural historians and the work that they do as part of the Section 106 process. And the bulk of this lecture is really going to focus on the Section 106 process, not so much on the historic preservation professionals who go in after that process and repurpose or reconstruct uh, historic structures and landscapes. There's only going to be a very little of that. The major professional areas in historic preservation are, as I said, archaeology. And that's what I do, and so there's a bias here. I'm going to be spending a little more time on that than others. History, and the historians that work in historic preservation tend to be architectural historians. But there are also cultural historians, uh, people who study the daily lives of, of people in the past, who play an important role in history uh, in terms of the Section 106 process in general, and in particular, and historic preservation in general, and then architecture. And there are architects whose job it is to design, build, and, and plan renovations, restorations, reconstructions. And we will talk a little bit about them and their role. So let's begin talking about the most important historic preservation professionals, archaeologists, and what archaeology does. I'm going to begin with a little background on the role of archaeology in historic preservation. And that goes back to the WPA and the TVA. Now we've talked about the Works Progress or Works Projects administration that changed names over time. Uh, and in terms of the beginnings of historic preservation as a, as a modern uh, practice that has federal involvement uh, coming out of WPA projects uh, and HABs and things like that. The TVA was another part of that. TVA is the Tennessee Valley Authority. And at roughly the same time when the WPA was working and then following after the WPA, the Tennessee Valley was turned into a transportation and a hydroelectric corridor. And, and so the development of the Tennessee Valley, and actually in lots of ways, infrastructure, roadways, all kinds of things, was an important way to develop southern Appalachia. And a lot of archaeologists were involved in that in the same way that they were involved in the river basin surveys. Um, so both for the Tennessee Valley Authority and then the big river basin surveys, which were really for the Missouri and the Colorado rivers were the primary ones that, and their tributaries that were looked at. These were surveys for development of those river valleys, for water access, for transportation, and for hydroelectric power. So it had to do with roadways and dams and bridges and electric lines and all of those things. And really, in, in both cases, part of the planning was what archaeological sites are going to get flooded by the reservoirs for dams? What archaeological sites are going to be damaged by bridges that are being put in? What archaeological sites are going to be damaged just in the construction of dams and canals and, and roadways and other things like that? 
these really began the practice of archaeology being deeply involved in historic preservation. And so that goes back to 1934 or so and continues until after the Second World War. Uh, the river basin surveys uh, take place up until about the time that the National Historic Preservation Act comes into play in 1966. We have the Historic Sites Act in 1935. We have some other developments along those lines, but it really is 1966 that we get the Historic Sites Act. And then by 67, 68, and ultimately 1971 with Nixon's executive order, we get the Section 106 process as we understand it today. So from roughly 1934 through to today, we have a continuous uh, engagement of archaeology in, in federal undertakings. Well, this just expands on the river basin surveys and what they were doing. So what we call cultural resources management, which is the field of archaeology and historic preservation today, stems from the essentially Section 106 process and everything that has come out of that. Um, and, and so again, we see this long history beginning about 1934 and continuing to, till today. Through that history, archaeology has developed a basic method of, eval of finding sites, evaluating those sites, and then mitigating sites that might be damaged. And the easiest way to talk about those, and the way that most CRM archaeologists talk about them, is in three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is survey. It's the way that you identify sites. First part of that is a record search. Every state maintains files on all of the archaeological sites found within their state. It's one of the roles of the SHPO. In, I, I hope it's all cases now. I know that a few years ago it wasn't, but I hope it's in all cases now. Those are electric they're online and are available to qualified professional archaeologists uh, to do a search and find out that in the area of an undertaking whether there are any known archaeological sites there. We've talked a lot about consultation. One goes out and talks to landowners, local residents, uh, non-professional hobbyist archaeologists, others to find out if anything is already known about the archaeological record in the area of an undertaking. And then one goes out and does survey. We call this non-invasive survey because in phase one, you don't want to damage anything. You want to just see what's there. And the most common form of non-invasive survey is what is called pedestrian survey, which means basically walking around. You walk around and look for archaeological sites. That sounds like it would not be very effective, but it actually is very effective. The archaeological record has a remarkable way of coming up to the surface by all kinds of means. By around here in Wisconsin, what's called cryoturbation, which is the freezing and thawing brings archaeological material from the ground up. From the process of worms and other insects moving things, from tree roots moving stuff, and of course from animals and humans digging in the ground and pulling stuff up. Where there is an archaeological site of any substance, there is often material on the ground surface, and so pedestrian surveying is actually a very useful technique, just walking around the ground, seeing what's there. It's most effective in plowed fields, on river banks that are eroding, uh, places where maybe trees have fallen over, where the subsoil is exposed. In a grassy field, it's not going to be that useful. In those contexts, sometimes forms of remote sensing can be very effective at finding archaeological sites. And 
that is a field that is vast to get into, but the most common forms are what I call passive and active. Passive means you're just reporting things that are there. So two passive means are aerial photography, just taking pictures of the ground and seeing if you can see patterns there that might reflect archaeological deposits. And the other one, measuring changes in the Earth's magnetism at a very precise, precise level using geomagnetic surveying tools to see if there are areas in the ground that have been changed in their magnetic character by humans. And we don't need to go into that, but there's lots of ways that the soils are changed by humans. For example, by uh, placing a hearth in the ground and baking the soil. That'll change its magnetic character. It can be identified. Then there are what I call active techniques, and those involve actively doing something to the ground and seeing what happens. And so two of the most common of those are what are, are called soil interface radar or ground penetrating radar, which sends a electrical pulse into the ground and then reads the pulse as it bounces back off of what's down below the ground. And through that, you can get an idea of what's in the subsoil. A related technique is called electric resistivity. And in that, you put probes into the ground and send out an electric current. And then you collect that current at another place and see where the current is moving faster or slower. That will tell you what's below the ground. Sometimes those remote sensing techniques can have remarkable ability to identify sites. Other times they can't. They're kind of hit or miss. But a combination of pedestrian and remote sensing survey is often very effective at finding sites in an area. And at the end of a phase one process, the idea is to identify all of the potential archaeological sites in a given area. Then we move on to phase two. Phase two is evaluating those sites for National Register eligibility. One way to do that is what now we would call invasive survey. Whereas before we're trying to not disturb anything, now we've identified all of the sites in an area of undertaking. We go to those that seem to be the most important, the ones that might be eligible for the National Register, and we do some intensive surveying there. Those often include two different forms. One of them are called shovel tests. Shovel test is simply taking a shovel, digging a hole about the size and the depth of a shovel, or about the same as a, a normal bucket, and taking that, putting that through a quarter inch mesh screen, and seeing what artifacts are in it. There's a lot of artifacts. There's probably a lot of material below the ground. There's not that many. There's probably not that much below the ground. It's a very effective way of evaluating sites. Soil probes um, are much quicker and less invasive, but a soil probe is essentially a long tube, a long hollow tube, that you stick into the soil, pull out, and it makes a core of the soil. If there are archaeological sites in that location, you can often see them in the soil, in, in profile of the soil. And so soil probing is another way that you can find archaeological sites. Another thing that's often done are what are called test excavations. These are relatively small excavations, maybe a meter by a meter, going down into the soil, just looking to see if there's anything there. They come after survey, again, has shown that something is there, and they are a way to test a site to see if there are potentially National Register eligible sites there. Once those are identified, and intensive survey and test excavation have suggested there may be National Register eligible eligible sites, there then is an evaluation that takes place uh, using the information from this and the survey to say, yeah, we really think 
that this site is eligible and needs to be examined further. Or we thought this site was eligible, but mm, it's probably not. The site is eligible. And whatever the undertaking is cannot avoid that site. Then we move on to phase three, which is essentially mitigation of the archaeological record. There's two ways to do that. If an undertaking can be changed in such a way that it doesn't directly destroy an archaeological site, but has the potential to impact it in other ways, for example, a highway drive going past a site that could create runoff that might damage a site, or trails going in through a park that are not going right into an archaeological site, but that an archaeological site is closely off the trail. Those aren't being directly damaged, but they could be impacted. Well, that will require a plan of monitoring, of going back regularly and monitoring that those sites are not being uh, damaged, and if they are, then finding some other way of mitigating them. The other means of mitigation is excavation, actually excavating the site, getting the information out of it before it's destroyed. The excavation should lead to a National Register nomination. Sometimes it doesn't. Monitoring usually will also, in theory, lead to a National Register nomination, and it's the information gained through the excavation or careful recording prior to monitoring or in association with monitoring that provides the information for the nomination. There's an interesting part that comes after phase three that I call phase four, which is the ongoing curation of the archaeological material and the records. And from an excavation, that material can be quite extensive and can be quite costly to maintain. It's an emerging problem in the field now that after whatever it is, 50 years of Section 106 work, we're running out of space for stuff. And new facilities are having to be built. And uh, it's an ongoing called a crisis in curation of where do we put all this stuff now that we've excavated it? And, and how do we ensure that it's curated? And working with museums, CRM archaeology is now wor working very hard to address that problem. The other problem that is also being addressed has to do with monitoring and excavation reports and how to get those out so that other scholars can use the information in them for their own research. We call those reports gray literature. In the times before Internet Archives, they were very hard to access. Now many of them are starting to be placed in Internet Archives. The problem is that they sometimes contain information that talks about other nearby sites, and there is an ongoing problem of sites being looted for the artifacts there that archaeologists want to prevent, so not giving out a lot of locational information. Okay, that's the archaeological part, and we're going to take a little break, come back, and talk about history. And now, music. Yeah, just one piece. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
move on and we are going to talk about history and architecture and the role that they play essentially in the section 106 process kind of the same way as we did for archaeologists but I'll begin with talking a little bit about the history of history and architecture in historic preservation we've gone through some of this already and it really begins with HAPS in 1933 goes on through today with cataloging historic buildings but there's a couple of other important federal programs that drew historians into historic preservation. One of them is the Historic Historical Records Survey, or HRS. This was part of the WPA, putting lots of people to work. And historians, part of what they did was to identify and assemble important documents in American history and index them and make them um, discoverable by researchers. Uh, that only lasted for a few years, but in fact, it provided under knowledge accessibility for many, many important documents used in uh, historic preservation. The other one that may seem a little odd is the Federal Writers Project, which only lasted from 36 to 1942. Federal Writers Project was part of the WPA and it was intended to provide employment for writers. And they did a number of important things. They created handbooks for every state. Um, one of the things, though, they did was a folklore project or oral history or life history project um, in which they went out and they talked to people about their lives and recorded a living history of the United States. Um, those have become invaluable in historic preservation because they tell the tales of what was going on in a community, what was happening in a given house, in a given downtown, in a given place. And so those have become increasingly important in historic preservation. In the Section 106 process, historians and historic architects follow a process uh, or sorry, not historic architects, architectural historians. Very important difference we'll talk about in a little bit. Architectural historians follow a process that's a lot like what archaeologists do in the Section 106 process. The first thing that they do is to go and look at all of the archival records for an area of undertaking. And those archival records will include the kind of things we talked about, cabs, historic records, and oral history, oral tradition things. It includes many of the resources we've talked about elsewhere in class to identify where historic properties in the area of the undertaking may be. They then do a physical survey and this is typically called a windshield or a walkover survey, basically getting out into the neighborhoods and seeing what structures are there. So again, this is very much like pedestrian survey in archaeology. Finally, when they identify those structures that might be important, they uh, photograph them, they make records of them, and they identify all those structures in an area of undertaking that might be of historical significance. So again, this is much like a phase one survey in archaeology, although here it's called a reconnaissance survey. The next stage is an intensive survey that's kind of like phase two in archaeology. In the intensive survey, the um, architectural historians go out and physically investigate structures they've identified in the first phase of the sur survey. And they'll go take pictures, they'll take sometimes measured drawings, um, they'll talk to, to the homeowners, get more information, go back, do more historic records checking, just gain a lot of information about those structures. And the idea, again, is to begin the process of seeing whether any of these structures is eligible to be listed on the National Register. Once structures eligible to be registered 
have been identified then there has to be a process in which potential damage is mitigated and there are a number of ways for that to happen one of them is to change the undertaking so a property is an affected but when a property is affected and is going to be torn down then the process is one of what's called documentation of that structure this is like excavation like phase three um, in archaeology in that it creates a full record of what was there the difference is that there's no phase four here and that's why I put it in and talking about archaeology there's no curation afterwards the house is destroyed and there's nothing left to really curate documentation um, is a major undertaking in itself that begins with a full study of the historical context of the structure uh, when it was built why it was built who used it what how it changed over time and that that is a huge task using all of the archival tools of the historian there is a more architectural piece of that which is the physical description of the structure much like the stuff that you saw that you've seen in Habs where you have scale drawings and photographs but going into e much more detail even the hardware that is on windows and doors and the physical infrastructure heating plumbing all those things that are in the house so that the entire physical structure is documented along with the historical context and then careful documentation of the really unique features of that structure whether they be architectural historical an important person uh, an important event careful documentation of those really unique features that make it national register eligible and then uh, photographs plans drawings and finally the mo most important part is putting in that national register um, the national register form okay I'm not going to take a break right now. Uh, we'll take a short. And now, sport. piece the preservation architect misspoke this before I said that the historic architect and the architectural historian I mix those up it's easy to do the architectural historian is the historian who goes out and does the reconnaissance and the intensive surveys and the documentation the preservation architect is an architect who focuses their work on historic properties they may very well be part of the process of documentation because their special knowledge and skills can be very useful in the documentation process more often though these architects because of their special training in historic building styles and construction and infrastructure and interior design become essential players in repurposing rehabilitation reconstruction of historic properties they're the ones who really lead those efforts they lead the efforts of documentation often but in many cases an architectural historian also has many of these skills to be able to do the documentation in terms of having the skills and the knowledge to actually build something to reconstruct something to make plans and get them through the planning department in a city and have the engineering proper so that the renovated building doesn't fall down that takes the preservation architect 
So those are special architects who deal with renovation, rehab, restoration, reconstruction. And they're in incredibly high demand. There aren't that many of them out there, even though they are essential to historic preservation. One of the ways that they are essential to historic preservation is that they are the people who typically create historic structures reports. And in terms of historic preservation of a structure that is going to be um, either reconstructed or preserved or rehabilitated as a, at, a, at a particular time period, an historic structures report is absolutely essential. Uh, and these are produced by a preservation architect in most cases. An architectural historian has the ability to do this and other trained historic preservation professionals, but it's usually a preservation architect. What an historic structures report consists of is a detailed account of the past, current use and condition of a structure. Why that's important is because it forms that documentary history, like is done at the documentation stage. Who built this? When? Why? How did it change over time? So that piece is in there. The other piece, though, is the piece of, and this is what it's like today. And if you want to preserve it, this is what needs to be done. If you want to reconstruct it, here are the changes that happen during to different times. And so here are the, the ways that you might reconstruct it at this time or that time. And here are the pieces of the building that need to go away or need to be fixed or whatever to do that preservation, that reconstruction, or for rehabilitation or repurposing. This is the stuff that needs to get worked on here's the stuff that's really of, of historical importance to keep. So historic structures report are a central piece of historic preservation. They are also the key to planning ahead. Because with a historic structures report, not only do you have the history, you have how it changed, you have how it is now. An important part of the historic structures report is also anticipating future issues or problems. What's happening in the neighborhood that might affect this property? What's happening on the ground with this property? What pieces of this property might be deteriorating or might face unique deterioration given how the community is growing? So it's really a key to planning also. In all these ways, the Historic Structures Report is an essential part, as I've said many times now, an essential part of historic preservation. And those are largely the job of a preservation architect. Okay, that's it for today. We'll see you next time. Oh, hi. Hey, I'm uh, sorry I wasn't here last week. You might have noticed I was trying to get a little bit of excitement during these kind of dull times, and uh, it didn't work out so good. So uh, I had my friend, as you know, Dr. Budelheimer come in. I hope he gave you a good talk last week. I know he's a very smart man. So I'm sure you were quite informed about some topic, but you might notice I'm back here at my cabin. Some people call it a castle, I call it a cabin. Um, and I've been reading in this book, Practical Heritage Management, page 324. And I'll read you a quote out of here that actually has got me a little irritated. Personality differences between archaeologists and historians slash architects may inhibit close interaction. Archaeologists tend to have more rugged and rough edge personas, probably due to a greater reliance on having to do extensive remote field work, often getting dirty. We tend to favor jeans and khaki shirts, even in the office, while architects and historians like slacks and dress shirts. Even when archaeologists do dress up, you rarely see one wearing a tie, much less a bow tie.
We drink beer and coffee. They drink wine and tea. What do you think of that? I find it actually insulting and inaccurate. And I think you can see in my talks here, I always wear a coat. Uh, I don't always wear a tie, but I think I look nicer than a lot of historians and even architects I've seen. Archaeologists are rugged and do our work in remote places. Well, I've been doing a lot of work in Kakana, which isn't particularly remote. And historians, architects are wimpy, flabby little people? I don't think so. So the question is, what does keep architects, historians, and archaeologists from working together more closely? Because the reality is that they don't work together that closely all the time. The answer is not personality. The answer is the very different kinds of work that we do and the very different kinds of perspectives we bring to that work. In fact, your book highlights many of those. And what I would like to suggest is that that's not a problem. In fact, that's a good thing because it allows us to bring many perspectives to the issue of historic preservation, to the question of significance, and to the question of mitigation. It's an interesting topic. I hope you'll give it some thought. Don't be